Hello, and welcome to uh, the RCS uh, Exchange Talks. Thanks for joining us this evening. My name is Alistair MacDonald. I'm a lecturer here at the RCS and I'm chairing the talk. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Dr. Mona Bosdog to talk about her research this evening. Mona is a lecturer in immersive experience design at Abate University. Her PhD at Abate was the collaboration between Abate University, the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland and the National Theatre of Scotland. So she's partly at home here too. Uh, Mona's research is practice based and focuses on the convergence of contemporary performance practices and video games, particularly designing hybrid forms of storytelling, performative games, mixed reality and immersive experience and games for public spaces and heritage sites. Um, without any further ado, over to Mona Bosdog. Thank you, Mona. Hello, thank you, Alistair. Um, hi, everyone. Yeah, as Alistair has already said, I am partly at home. Um, it's really good to be back, and thank you so much for having me, um, uh, even if it's in a virtual and slightly disembodied form. Um, today I want to discuss my PhD project and revisit it with horror, might I add, um, or more appropriately some of its highlights. First of all, I want to give a bit of information about where I come from because I feel like that's relevant to how I approached my doctoral project. So my background is in writing for performance. Um, I was a playwright and dramaturg with an interest in mediation, lived experience and autobiography. These interests are very much present in my practice now as I make games or playful experiences that bring people together usually intended for social settings and which use similar design approaches, combining digital and physical elements to enhance the social potential of video games. I continue to explore the potential of video games for capturing and extending the accessibility of oral histories and lived experience, but also the transformative potential of play. My journey started five years ago when I discovered the PhD opportunity, which called for applications for a research project entitled Connecting Performance and Play, establishing interdisciplinary design methods for the development of video games and performance. This was a partnership, as Alistair already mentioned, between Aberdeen University, the Royal Conservatory of Scotland and the National Theatre of Scotland offered through the Scottish Graduate School for Arts and Humanities and funded by Arlings and the Scottish Founding Council. The project, as its name suggests, was preoccupied with the development of interdisciplinary design methods, which draw from contemporary performance and video games. As part of my PhD, I developed two hybrid multimedia events, which blended elements of performance with video games. Both projects aim to explore through making and subsequent reflection how game design and contemporary performance practice can both inform and contribute to the development of new and hybrid experiences. However, each project stemmed from a different curiosity of practice and mapped onto a different stage of the research process. Each one project was a proof of concept and it helped me to understand the conventions and affordances of video games through a process of transmedia adaptation. So for me, the way to better understand video games was to translate them, to filter them through what I was familiar with, and this was the language of performance. This helped me to arrive at the design method, which was both site and game responsive. In the second project, Generation ZXX, I continued to develop this method of working across both media to create a video game and a performance which would complement each other to create a hybrid narrative and synesthetic experience. I'm using synesthetic here as Josephine Marshall defined it, a dual process of sense and meaning making. Through Generation ZXX, I aim to explore the affordances of both mediums to enliven the archive through various modes of engagement. The resulting design framework was called story walking. 
This was developed and refined in the process of creating and critically reflecting on work which is hybrid in its structure, so with mixed media and mixed reality components, and interdisciplinary in its design, video game design and site-specific performance practice. Although story walking draws from both site-specific performance and game design, it also creates its own hybrid aesthetic and storytelling techniques. So the story unfolds across multimedia and mixed reality components. It combines walking as an aesthetic, critical and dramaturgical practice of reading and performing an environment with designing interactive, complex, sensory and story rich environments for a moving meaning making body. In exploring what design techniques and strategies would be most suited, I focused on three components. Designing meaningful agency for the audience players, creating an environment which invites playful exploration and which supports complex synesthetic processes, and finally creating varied and surprising moments of encounter and modes of engagement that invite the audience players to rediscover their environment. I'll start with discussing the design of Inchcom project. Um, this was a live event which took place on 16th of October, so almost four years to the day, uh, on the Scottish island of Inchcombe. It was attended by 50 invited guests from video games and performance backgrounds. For two hours, the guests wandered the island to encounter moments of storytelling, music, performance, and installations. Inchcombe was structured as a three-part event. The first was a promenade performance, an adaptation of the game Dear Esther called Dear Rachel. It was followed by a gameplay projection, the same game Dear Esther was played live and projected inside Inchcombe Abbey. And finally, a musical performance. So I worked with a collective of musicians from Edinburgh called Mantra Collective, who arranged and performed Dear Esther's soundtrack live in the 12th century Inchcombe Abbey. The audience installed the Sonic Maps app on their phones and were given a map and invited to explore the island. 22 audio files were geotagged on the island, the paper boats that you can see here in the map. When the audience reached their location, the app would start playing the audio files from their phones. They could also encounter 10 sound or visual installations represented more abstractly on the map. So adaptation offered me a way of creating a response to the arrestor, but in a medium in, uh, whose conventions, methods, and techniques were familiar to me. It also offered me a practical way of researching and understanding the conventions and strategies of video games. In adapting the arrestor, I wanted to build on its design while at the same time to create a new piece of site responsive work. The motivation behind this was threefold. I wanted to understand how games create a meaningful player experience, to explore how games and performance could complement each other to create these complex interactive narrative sensory experiences, and how they could be brought together through an overarching narrative theme and common setting. Developing Inchcombe project involve processes of adaptation of a game and to a site, and dramaturgy of assemblage and synesthetics. These shape the design strategies, techniques, and tools deployed in its making. The hybrid nature of the project, having live and virtual components, demanded that I develop interdisciplinary working methods, borrowing from both game design and performance practice. The first step was to select a game and a site that were suitable and evocative of one another. Next, I wanted to understand how the arrestor manages to create a meaningful gameplay experience. And this involved the process of reverse engineering its design, going behind the gameplay experience to analyze the design strategies which underpin its visual style and environments, its narrative, sound, and interaction design. These design strategies were then adapted to Inchcolm Island, filtered through its narrative, sensory, structural, and symbolic presence. The Arrester was developed by the Chinese Room, initially as a mod for Half-Life 2 in 2008, and then as a standalone game in 2012. 
The game is important in video game culture because it shaped video game history by defining a new genre, the walking simulator. In walking sims, the player mostly walks through the game world, interacting with its objects and environments, which makes them accessible to a diverse player community, regardless of their previous gaming knowledge. In The Arrester, the player is stranded on a Hebridean island to explore its histories, legends, and ghosts, and discover the story behind its enigmatic narrator and his traumatic past. As they walk around the island, they trigger snippets of voiceover narration and encounter moments of environmental storytelling. To focus the player's attention on the environment and the narrative, the designers have stripped down the game's mechanics so, or their actions to a bare minimum. The only permitted in-game actions are walking, limited swimming, zooming in, and looking around. In order to adapt the game as an interactive performance, the actions or mechanics of the game need to be performable by a physical body in a physical environment. But I also wanted the performance to be first and foremost a sensory and narrative experience, which meant I was not interested in win conditions, competitive mechanics, or traditional goals like scoring points or gaining collectibles, which is why I eventually narrowed down the pool of potential games to only include first-person, non-competitive narrative games. While all of them had something unique to offer in terms of either immersive atmosphere, environments and sounds, or interesting forms of combining interaction and storytelling, none of them appealed or stayed with me as much as The Arrester. This is perhaps because The Arrester blends aspects from all the, those genres that I find most interesting the joy of exploration and discovery found in exploration games, the ease of navigation and the intricate environmental storytelling found in walking simulators, the haunting atmosphere and evocative sound found in horror games, a visual and poetic language and an emphasis on player-driven meaning found in art and serious games, and finally the cryptic and abstract narratives that we usually find in puzzle games. I realized that as a playwright, I was interested in how I could adapt the poetic text. As a dramaturg, I wanted to recreate the openness of the text and to devise a way of walking as synesthetics. And as a designer, I wanted to explore the narrative, symbolic and sensory opportunities afforded by an island space. The island site was a central aspect of the project and created a moment of connection between the arrestor and Inchcombe. Inchcomb project was utterly shaped by Inchcomb Island. Its affordances and limitations impacted on the design. The island's physical presence impacted on how the performance was structured, how we worked with sound, where the installations and the musicians were stationed, the routes and paths that could be explored, how we guide the navigation, how we use the locations um, that were uh, inaccessible and so on. The island sensory potential was also employed to the full. The smells, the sounds, the colors and the textures, the mood of some of its locations, the spaces that conveyed certain feelings like isolation, exposure, awe, wonder or vertigo. These functions of the site inside specific work are summed up by Fiona Wilkie's observation that quote, site-specific performance engages with site as symbol, site as storyteller, site as structure, unquote. Site as structures how we move. It dictates the rhythm of progression. It invites us to explore and conditions our progression. It only reveals its secrets to those who dare take on its challenge. And for their effort, it rewards them with unforgettable and breathtaking vistas. It is constantly changing and surprising. It hosts the stories we want to tell, adding its own voice to the narrative. But it also tells its own stories about its history, its uses and the ways in which it has been lived in, but also about us, its inhabitants and its visitors. Inchcombe's histories, tales, legends, and superstitions made their way into the text. 
The legend of the founding of Inchcombe Abbey speaks of a hermit who offered Alexander I of Scotland and his men shelter during a storm. He shared with them his cell, his cow's milk, and the shells he had gathered on the shores. In return, Alexander pledged to build an abbey so that refuge would always be available for those lost or seeking shelter. The east side of the island speaks of its most recent history, a military fort built to defend the capital during the First and Second World Wars. Here, derelict military buildings are reclaimed by vegetation and inhabited by gulls, left in disrepair and mostly ignored by tourists. The cannon tracks in the battlement, the ammunition and supply tracks cutting lines across the island, the living barracks atop the hill, the communication aerials all share their tales of woe. The few that venture on this side of the island have scribbled on the walls. Messages of love, friendship, and the ob ob obscenity have been repeatedly erased by salty winds, just to be written over again by persistent hands. Phil Smith makes the distinction between ruins and ruins, ruined spaces from which ruination has been carefully removed. The west side of the island is thus a ruin, a testament to the island's romantic and monastic history. Its wilderness is tamed, and its deserted Scottish island aesthetic is carefully staged. In ruins, as Eden Snor argues, we are haunted by the signs of the past that project us back to things we half know or have heard about, recollections of a past we can hardly recognize, and carry us outwards to other places in the memory or imagination, unquote. Which is perhaps why the island in, uh, in the Arrester and Inchcombe are so well aesthetically suited. They are both filled with their own ghosts of the past. But Inchcombe is also an island, carrying with it all the symbolic significance that we attach to islands. Islands have been a source of inspiration for all forms of art in all civilizations and at all times. Video games are no exception. A, a search on Steam, which is a game streaming service with the keyword island, returns over 3,000 results. Most likely the word island summons imagery like this. Islands are products of volcanic activity, fissural deposit, a drifting of the land, and maybe more importantly, a drifting of the imagination. They can be natural or man-made. They come in all shapes and sizes. Island spaces are paradoxically charged, drawing attention to a vast array of dualities. Refuge prison, isolated connected, insular creative, heaven purgatory, small hidden. They are what Baldacchino calls nervous dualities, in that they are isolated, but at the same time connected, real and imagined, safe and dangerous. They foster tradition, but also innovation. They are paradises, but also gulags, home and exile, escape and prison, space and place, desire and fear. The island space illustrates the dynamic relationship between the real and the imaginary, between individual and society, the old and the new, between the static land and the transformative water. The island is a, a place of transformations and mutations of exchangings between worlds. It is a heterotopia, a place that equally fascinates and scares. So the design of Inch Home project combined the four design pillars originating in the Arrester with constraints and opportunities afforded by Inchcomb Island. In what follows, I will discuss how the visual narrative, sound and interaction design of the Arrester were adapted and transformed in their encounter with Inchcomb Island. The visual design combined environmental storytelling techniques from the Arrester with site-specific and site-responsive design. I engaged with Robert Briscoe's design strategies developed in the Arrester to shape the environment as an emotional and narrative landscape through use of macro and micro details, subliminal signposting, and dramatic elements. Subliminal signposting engages with the environment's ability to unconsciously guide the player through some of the more figurative aspects of the story, not directly conveyed through the narrative. 
In Inch Home Project, for example, the elements of environmental storytelling, similar to the arrestor, are designed to communicate the traumatic event, which explains the presence of the character on the island. The use of color in the arrestor gains symbolic and narrative significance because it acts as a visual manifestation of the memory of this traumatic event. The memory is projected onto the environment, causing a dramaturgical conflict with the natural landscape. Meaning becomes unstable when car parts, for example, start appearing on the island. This event is represented through recurring colors, displaced and misplaced objects, and natural assemblages of natural and human-made materials. In the arrestor, the fluorescent grill, uh, green of a car accident starts taking over the island, while in the Rachel, the orange of the refugee crisis bleeds over the environment. The design of a dramatic visual style in Inchcombe project revolved around focusing the audience's attention on the dramatic landscape. This was achieved by tagging the audio files and positioning the installations and musicians in aesthetically and dramaturgically meaningful locations, which drew attention to and emphasized the island's environments and narratives. The audio file locations opened up vistas and panoramas, offering views of the firth, the shores, or the island itself. They expose the island in the changing light of late afternoon and the constantly changing cloud patterns. In both the Rachel and the Arrestor, walking is the main form of interaction with the design story world. In Inchcombe project, walking fulfills an aesthetic and a dramaturgical function. Aesthetic in that the walk was a performance, a series of encounters with sound files, installations, environments, and other audience players, which was assembled through walking. Dramaturgical in that the process of meaning making is enabled and performed by the moving body. Again, making sense and sense making. Not just a cognitive activity, but also a sensory one. In Inchon project, I intended to design opportunities for walking, either alone or with others. The sound was designed to mirror the multi-layered texture of the arrestor soundscape, music, diegetic sounds, and the acousmatic male eye voice speaking in the ear. It also responded to the site, we did numerous field recordings, to the game, the layering of diegetic and non-diegetic sound mirrored the arrestor sound design, and to the narrative, sound effects were used to reinforce the interpretation that the voice is an ethereal remain echoing through time. The headphones facilitated an intimate and isolating experience, yet allowed for environmental sounds to pierce through and enrich the soundscape. The position of the audio files and installations was carefully selected so as to facilitate a diverse and sensory stimulating walk. The sound of radio static was used to mark the beginning and end of transmission, thus signaling to the audience that the voiceover uh, was about to start. This supported an element of expectation, giving the audience time to settle into an active listening mode. Together, the audio files created a sonic ruin, an eclectic composition of sound textures, rhythms, and surfaces narrative debris drifting on radio waves, as Misha Myers once beautifully called it. In Inchon Project, the ruined landscape is mirrored in the ruined soundscape, their fragmented, open and broken nature requiring interpretive effort, asking the audience to fill in the gaps. Music was added in specific sound files to support the emotional tone of the voice and to give a sense of emotional progression. We used music from the Dear Esther soundtrack to ensure continuity between the world of the game and the world of the performance. The musicians were performing instrumental solos from Always, arranged by Lucy Holland and David Jamieson in various locations around the island. These instrumental solos were echoes of the musical theme, isolated voices in a disjointed and parallel dialogue that have not yet found musical unity. The writing process started with breaking down the text in the arrestor into phrases and words that were either repeated obsessively or that created powerful and memorable images. Some of them later became leitmotifs in the Rachel, the hermit, refuge, salvation, gulls, 
ghosts, and so on. In writing the Dear Rachel text, I worked with a set of creative constraints. Firstly, I wanted to write in a poetic and epistolary style that mirrors the rhythm, style, and ambiguity of the narration in Dear Esther. While at the same time, I wanted to write in the text the islands, legends, and history. I also aimed, when possible, to write on the island, responding to and referencing its environments, locations, sounds, smells, tastes, and textures. The texts were written for their intended locations, conveying some of my emotional responses to them, as well as referencing visual, auditory, olfactory, or tactile stimuli. Because I wanted to foreground the interpretive abilities of the audience players, the text was intentionally ambiguous and fragmented in 20 pieces, which was scattered around the island. As a playwright, I found this extremely challenging because I had to let go of authorial control and create a narrative playground instead, where the audience encounter bits of the narrative as voiceover or as installations, and then they creatively assemble them as they see fit. The story in Dear Rachel responds to the game's themes, dealing with guilt and loss, forgiveness and redemption, while at the same time engaging with the wider ongoing debates surrounding refuge, safety, and humanity, and thus transforming the arrestor's theme of individual loss and grief into a societal one. The moments of adapted environmental storytelling details similarly link the arrestor to Inchcomb the paper boats, the candles, the feathers, eggs, and bird nests. Being a loosely adapted text, Dear Rachel was a constant negotiation between the source text and the potential text. This potential text was equally shaped by the site, its symbolic potential added another dramaturgical layer to the narrative, its stories and histories were embodied by its environment, and its physical appearance constantly shaped the structure of the text. These three functions of the site, a symbol, structure, and storyteller, shape the text by guiding its reception, so where the text is experienced. By shaping its themes, the text was site responsive, and by aiding its semiotic and sensory interpretation, so the symbolism of the island as refuge and prison eventually grew into the theme of the performance. As I was moving into the design process for my second project, there were three clear design heuristics that I wanted to continue to explore. First, an open dramaturgy, which accommodates and facilitates a multiplicity of readings. Second, the aesthetic of the ruin and the aesthetic of the palimpsest in video games and performance, and how they invite the audience player to complete the work by focusing their attention on what is missing, what has been erased or what is threatened by erasure or rewriting. And finally, the complex relationship between the work and the site, the ghost and the host in Pearson and Edmund Lucas terminology. The second project, Different Aesthetic Here, uh, took place on 4th of May, 2018 at Camperdown Park and at the JTC Furniture Group, which is the site where the Timex Camperdown factory used to sit. This is in Dundee. In this factory, thousands of women assembled the Sinclair ZX81 and the ZX Spectrum computers. These were the first massively popular home computers. And because they were manufactured locally and were retailed at discounted prices, they made their way into many Dundonian houses. Many local developers consider this to be the reason why Dundee is such an important development and games education center. Generation ZXX illustrates the tenets of a, a typical story walk. It is a melange of modes of engagement, performance, walking, playing, and singing. It is inspired by a site and the lived memories of that site. These multiple modes of engagement explore different aspects of an archive to capture, preserve, and share oral histories and lived experience in diverse ways and with diverse audiences. This archive of lived experience was comprised of oral histories, personal archives of former employees, photographic archives, audio video archives, personal archives like the archive of John Carnegie, which was developed during the production on the line, and so on. 
This archive informed the development of Generation ZXX, and to it I added um, nine interviews with leading game developers about the impact that the Spectrum has had on their career and the game industry at large. These interviews were used as the soundtrack to the, project, uh, to the projection. This projection was footage from Timex as the millionth ZX Spectrum rolls off the assembly line, and it showed how the Timex managers escort Circlife Sinclair around the factory to watch the production process. This video actually exposed one of the themes of the project, which was the invisibility of female labor as the women work silently on the assembly line under the scrutiny of men in positions of power. Like Inchcon Project, Generation ZX took the form of a public event, which invited the audience players to explore the site and its history through different modes of engagement. The event was structured as a four-part experience, an audio walk, a play party, a film projection, and a musical performance. These four components developed simultaneously and informed each other. The audience engaged with the oral histories of the women who worked in the factory, performed conviviality and community as they played together the three games installed at the factory, witnessed the gender politics of Timex, and listened as game developers acknowledged the women's labor and its impact on the industry and the city. The final musical performance brought back to the factory women singing as three women's choirs led by Alice Mara performed Women of Dundee by Sheena Wellington. Over the course of an hour, the audience players explored the parking groups in search of snippets of interviews with the women who assembled the ZX Spectrum. I concluded the interviews with 11 former Timex employees, all women, which amounted to over 12 hours of recorded material. These sound files were positioned in various locations around the park and the balloon was marking the place where a specific sound file should be played. The balloons were color coded, each color corresponded to an interviewee. I thematically grouped the audio files in five categories, three words, working on the computers, working in Timex, the strikes and fun and friendship and each of these categories was mapped to a certain area in the park. Um, I used a verbatim technique in selecting the material and in arranging it thematically. The audience players composed the narrative by moving through the park, therefore a part of the creative editing inherent in the verbatim form was delegated to them. As they explored together the memories of Timex, they were invited to perform conviviality, solidarity, and community, thus acting what Timex was in the collective memory and lived experience. This was supported by the technology and an invitation to walk together. Sharing the phones to access the sound files facilitated group formation and intergen intergenerational exchange as audience players gathered around them to listen. Convivial walking aimed to facilitate dialogue and bonding as the audience players adjusted their pace, rhythm and direction to accommodate each other and to share their own memories and experiences of Dundee. The audience were then escorted to the former Time Ice Camperdown building where a pop-up arcade was set up. In the custom-built arcade cabinets, they could uh, play two games, Sheetown and Assembly, designed by Abertay student team Retrospect and Abertay Game Lab staff. The third game, Breaking Out of the Frame, was projected onto the factory building and it was controlled by the crowd as they moved left and right together. The games also responded to the archive of lived experience, showcasing how different types of game design can capture different aspects of the archive. So spatial progression rewarded with storytelling in Sheetown, codependency in gameplay and facilitating performance of the archive through alternative controllers in assembly, and gameplay as metaphor, revealing the hidden stories latent in the site in breaking out of the frame. All games were developed around three major types of constraints, thematic, aesthetic, and technological. The games had to respond to the documentation materials, they had to adopt the ZX Spectrum aesthetic, 
and they had to be easily playable by a wide demographic, therefore using intuitive controls. Assembly is a three-player cooperative game and installation. Three players work the assembly line together to make as many ZX spectrums as possible. To bring their component down from the assembly line to the workstation, they press the top button, and then they press the side button to pass it down the line to their co-players. I was interested in designing a game that has potential for stimulating performative and social play, which supports people moving and playing together. This conveyed the themes of the project, camaraderie, conviviality, playful subversion, and intergenerational exchange through gameplay. The game adopted a girl punk aesthetic using animal print pink faux fur to echo the, uh, the practices of um, playful subversion through feminist aesthetics. This was a visual tribute to the women of Dundee who are often described as being strong, independent, and feisty. Pink was also the color of the Timex New Starts uniforms that were known as pinkies and that all the interviewees remembered fondly. The game requires that the three players work together as a team, pay attention to and help each other. This is what we have called design for a semi-spectatorship the creation of in-game dependencies and altered player workloads throughout the play experience to encourage teamwork. These in-game dependencies are easy to observe in assembly. If the first player does not manage to get the circuit board to the second player, the second player can do their bit and can pass it along to the third player and so on. This in-game interdependency mirrors the assembly line process. Sheetown is a third-person platformer in which the player controls Pinky, a pixel art avatar in pink overall, as she makes her way through the factory levels to collect the letters that spell Timex. Each letter collected rewarded the player with text that tells the story of Sheetown. The title refers to Dundee's nickname, which captures its gendered labor history, women as breadwinners and men as kettle boilers. To facilitate access, the games were installed, installed on site in two arcades uh, designed by Ursula Cheng and Alice Carnegie. The arcade cabinets fulfilled similar aesthetic, dramaturgical, and accessibility functions to those of the custom built installation of assembly. They were colorful and bold, visually reinforcing the themes, uh, but also the size and angle of the monitors alongside the colorful design and lights invited and supported semi-spectatorship by pulling players in and along, allowing an over-the-shoulder viewing angle. The arcade aesthetic was familiar and thus less intimidating for a wider demographic. This type of design and curation, which encourages semi-spectatorship, not only enhances the game's potential for social play, leading to bonding and community formation, but also reduces the anxiety and intimidation of participation making the game more inclusive, inviting, and accessible. The game's aesthetic and design reference both the ZX Spectrum and arcade games and anchor the audience player's experience in a certain moment in time and space, namely the early 80s when the ZX Spectrum was built in the Timex factory. The game's nostalgic design and aesthetics paid homage to the heritage of the ZX Spectrum and was intended as a celebration of its influence and impact. Sheetown's visual style, level design, sound design, and gameplay conspire to create a nostalgic feeling for the ZX Spectrum games, the joy and sometimes frustration associated with them. Breaking Out of the Frame was a movement crowd-controlled game designed by Neil Moody, Kaylee McLeod, and myself. During the game, the audience players are required to move left and right to control their collective avatar, Pinky. Pinky is running to collect ZX Spectrums while avoiding other computers from that time, namely ZX Spectrum's American rival, the Commodore 64. This game created opportunities for audience to play together and explore recent episodes in Dundee's history. This history is not fragmented, but a continuous narrative of specialized and skilled labor 
passed on from generation to generation. This was reinforced by the visuals where the shipbuilding industry transitions into the whaling industry, followed by the jute industry, and finally the electronics manufacturing industry. The final canvas was an image of Dundee with a welcome to Sheetown neon sign, thus bringing together all the narrative threads and themes of the event. Projecting it onto the factory wall invited the audience to literally uncover the hidden layers of history by moving on it. Breaking out of the frame is the epitome of convivial gameplay, which generates togetherness and community. It is spectacular and accessible, inviting everyone to play along. It is performative and through its symbolic and expressive mechanics holds the potential for transformation. And finally, it transforms gameplay into an embodied narrative experience as the moving bodies of the players drive it forward. Its design responded to a story and a site constantly adapting to both. Furthermore, it emphasized the truly collaborative, fluid and playful working progress, showing the potential of interdisciplinary design methods and creative communities. In working across performance and video games, I explored various models of experience design. The resulting event responded to a memory site by inviting the audience to engage with and uncover the lived collective memory deposited there through live performance and gameplay. Crossing the factory gates be became an opportunity to write over the memories of the strikes by unearthing older memories of conviviality and sisterhood of a factory where nearly 2,000 women worked together, but also the chance to create new memories for the women of Timex, of the industry's acknowledgement and gratitude for their labor, and potentially of a newfound pride in witnessing the heritage and the impact of their work. The site's complexity invited multiple readings, a depository of collective memory, a palimpsest, a ruin, a ghost, the last bastion of union, union action in Scotland, the cradle of Scotland's video games industry, a factory divided across gender lines, a utopian space where women created their own structures of power within and despite official structures, or a dystopian space where women's access to knowledge, training and equal pay was tightly controlled by the powerful few. Any of these readings is as valuable and as important as the next, and none takes precedence over the other. The audience players move through physical, virtual, and hybrid spaces to uncover fragments of narratives, voices, and memories. This journey invited them to listen, watch, sense, witness, play, and eventually complete the work by contributing their own interpretation, memories, and narratives. Developing the games and the performance in parallel allowed me to design elements of continuity. Narrative, so the many aspects relating to Timex, working Timex, the strikes, assembling the spectrum, the spectrum heritage and its impact on the game industry, but also visual, the character Pinky, the picket signs, the punk aesthetic, the ZX spectrum aesthetic, and conceptual, the women's voices, memory sites, palimpsests, ruin, nostalgia, and collective memory. Through Generation ZXX, I discovered that some aspects of the archive lend themselves better to gameplay, whereas others could come to life better through performance. The moments of gameplay aim to support conviviality, camaraderie, and social play through design for spectatorship. In turn, the performance created an overall framework for the experience launching an invitation to embodied interaction and giving the audience players permission to play. Performance and gameplay thus supported, contextualized and expanded each other narratively and aesthetically. And I think that's me. Thank you, Mona. Thank you. Uh, for a really fascinating talk. It's um, uh, amazing work, multi-layered, playful, imaginative, and uh, two very contrasting works. Um, we've got uh, a question in the Q&A, so let's go straight there. 
Um, could level design be considered a transferable skill into theatre set design? Uh, if possible, could you recommend any research papers addressing this or any other comparisons between games and theatre? It was briefly mentioned in environmental storytelling, creative immersive 3D worlds using lessons from learned from the theme park industry by John Carson, but I'm having trouble finding anything beyond this. Yes, it was. Uh, and indeed, you you might find quite a lot of information in immersive theatres by Josephine Marshall as well, particularly in, in the interviews with um, immersive theatre makers, um, particularly because that set is indeed a, a theme park, is indeed something that you can navigate through. Um, but I would say the level designs actually learned quite a bit from stage design and from set design because in terms of um, how you guide the line of sight, uh, how you draw attention to certain elements, how you, you use that kind of environmental storytelling to draw participation, so leaving a, a, a wardrobe or a cupboard slightly open or having a, a painting slightly um, I, I can't remember the word, um, mm. <laughs> not very centered. Uh, all of these things kind of ask you to interact with them. So I definitely recommend immersive theaters and, and reading a bit more about um, immersive theater because that's, that's where I found a lot of overlap between the two. Thanks. Uh, there's another question here. Um, thanks, Mona. Loved hearing about your research. As we become more and more intertwined with technology, especially during COVID, simulation and play can enable us to do things we may not be able to achieve in person. How do you imagine the potentiality of gaming and simulation will shape our future? <laughs> that's, that's a hard question. <laughs> Uh, particularly because during the pandemic and because of all the overflow of technology, uh, what me and my colleague did is actually designing uh, a physical playground um, outside the VNA in chalk. So I think we, we took the other approach of, of moving out with technology. Um, but I think, I think there's a lot, I think there's uh, the, some of the workshops that I've attended during COVID in particular were making use of this kind of rectangular formats and numerous faces and passing objects along and pulling objects down and, and trying to, to adapt to this. Um, but simulation is quite a complex area and, and games are very rudimentary and very simple simulations because they don't go into a lot of of detail or there'd be a bit information overflow i feel um but yeah i i, I think the answer is i i don't know how i envision <laughs> this future i'm scared of it uh, but yeah i'm sorry <laughs> um Another question. Uh, I really like the Inchcombe project and its connection with nature and landscape. Uh, are there any plans for this to go ahead again in the future? Uh, if not, is it something you'd like to explore further in different setting and context? Yes, and I think for a, for a while it disappeared because Sonic Maps uh, stopped existing, but I think Sonic Maps has relaunched the version 2.0 now, um, and that's a premium, so I might try to, to resurrect the project. I think some of the complexities there are, of course, working with the partners again. So um, Historic Environment Scotland, getting access to the island, and of course, getting people together on a boat, which might be quite a far, far ahead time in the future when we can do that again. But yeah, I would love to. I would love to return. Every October, I get nostalgic. <laughs> Thanks. Um, there's another question about the reception for the interactive games in Dundee aimed at women. Can you talk a bit about the reception of those games? Um, I guess so. I think uh, in terms of the, the personal stories of the women and, and the, the, the kind of sense of pride they took in it, uh, because most of the women that I've interviewed were there and we did numerous repeated interviews and we still meet for tea and cake when that was still remember tea and cake <laughs> uh, 
um, um, but I think the, the really nice thing was that they said I did them proud and I think that was a moment of quite overwhelming I think particularly because the thing that that upset me and, and kind of disturbed me the most was that they they were not aware of the massive impact that their work has had and I think having that that moment where where they started realizing that these developers are thanking them for then this present in in creative industries and gaming was quite a, a, a strong and, and powerful moment and I think yeah um, but other than that I think it's it's been a project that's been showcased extensively I think as well um, I think some of the really interesting behaviors that we obs observed from it every time we showcase it is that it, it tends to be like audiences of all ages that really enjoy it. Uh, it's easy to play for audiences uh, that are slightly elderly. And that was one of the reasons why we designed it the way we designed it. It was so that the women can play uh, quite easily, but also children. Children absolutely love it and they get so um, absorbed into the repetitive action of, of just smashing the buttons. That is quite nice to watch. Um, uh, we've got a few more questions. Um, uh, which one first? Okay, your work sounds fascinating. Thanks for sharing. What's the next aspect of gaming that you'd like to bring into the performative and theatrical world? Perhaps open world games management or builder games, narrative games or others? It's interesting because at the moment I'm working on just video games. So I think I'm I'm kind of starting to move a lot of my interest in performance into the medium of video games. So we've been working in, I'm working with um, artists and programmers in Romania at the moment on an archive of lived experience of life before internet. So we're trying to see how we can design a series of games that capture again that sense of community communication and some of these like larger themes that got profoundly changed by by internet um so i think that's that's the direction in which i'm i'm moving at the moment and a lot of um i think my interest in physical controllers so i've been working on a smell controller um but again a lot of the projects have been put on hold <laughs> throughout the, the pandemic which i'm sure a lot of you are experiencing as well um Somebody asks, I was fascinated by the connection to nature and landscape in the Inchcombe project. Did the unpredictability of nature have an effect on how you created the work? Yes, it did. And there were uh, a lot of things that were, were unexpected. So many things that were unexpected. I think the fact that we, we went location scouting in March and April mostly, and the island was completely overtaken by its by seagulls and they were in nesting season so we couldn't see the, the entire east side of the island practically um, unless we risked a, a kind of slightly hitchcock moment which we, we didn't really want to do um, but then we discovered that the island looks completely different in different light the island looks completely different in seasons when it's rained a lot of the areas get completely flooded and inaccessible so I try to observe the island as much as possible in all of these different um, conditions and try to plan ahead, but that didn't really help because the tide still made all of our paper boats disappear and a lot of the things that we designed for were, were kind of all of our efforts uh, got swept away. But at the same time, there were unpredictable ones as well. So the sound that the wind made through elder trees or the sound of the wind in the wind tunnel, there were um, the, uh, we did two performances. So maybe it was, it was, the time was too short for me to cover everything, but we did two performances. During the first one, it rained. Um, and during the second one, it didn't. And uh, we had post-show discussions and, and um, the kind of the overall mood between the two groups uh, was was really different because of the light. So some the first group felt it quite, dare I say, unhopeful maybe and 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 heavy. <laughs> 
whereas the second group saw the silver linings that they constantly saw the light kind of skimming through so that influenced the way they they read and interpreted the text as well great thanks uh, there is one more question uh, was the chalk based project done alongside lynn love yes it was it was me and lynn stigma uh, surrounding play so enjoyed that study yeah Yes, it was me and Lynn uh, who designed the chalkscape at the PNA. Right. Well, thank you, everybody. There are lots of thanks. Um, oh, one more question. Uh, these work, works draw on so many different disciplines. Where do you locate yourself in this? What kind of artist are you? So, mm -hmm. nice little question to finish with. <laughs> what kind of artist am I, really? Um, yeah, I think it's hard, and I think uh coming to present here tonight as well it, it felt like i'm going through my second viva a little bit because <laughs> i feel like I've, I've not been tested at rcs yet um but I, yeah i i don't know i think i've always been a bit of the odd one out because i would go to gaming conventions and i would always be the the performancey person and then i would go to performance conferences and i would always be the gamey person so I think I found my place somewhere in, in kind of the middle, which is kind of attested in my title as well, which is immersive experience design, um, I guess is where, where I kind of sit. Um, and that's not at all linked to technology, I want to add, because whenever people hear immersive design, they just think VR, which is really not the case. <laughs> um, so yeah. We have got maybe just half a minute more. So there's somebody's asking, um, thanks for sharing. I'd like to delve deeper into this hybrid of game and performance, but it seems quite niche. Could you share any companies or other individuals that have similar work? Um, I looked at numerous practices that, that somewhat overlap. Um, I looked at immersive theatres. I looked at escape rooms. Um, I looked at a lot of um, alternate reality games. Um, so these are in general um, almost flash mobs or, or kind of games that happen, take the gaming element from the virtual and move it into the real world. Pervasive games is another really good term for this. So they're in general games that don't have clear and distinct boundaries. So play happens everywhere, uh, whether most people acknowledge it or not. And I think it's also a lot of the recent kind of AR games, so Pokemon Go and Ingress and um, all of these games usually use the real world as, as a kind of playground. So there are, there are related practices, but none that are, I guess, looking exactly at bringing elements from one into the other specifically. I think they're just separate forms. So I've been trying to pull from all of them. Thanks, Mona. Um, thanks very much for joining us, everybody. Um, thanks to the BSL interpreters, Thomas, Sabine, and the closed captioner. Uh, thanks to the knowledge research, sorry, the research and knowledge exchange team. Uh, please do follow us on Twitter at rcs underscore the exchange. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's a link to the full series of talks in the chat. Next week's talk will be Dr. Fabrice Fitch talking about live performance post COVID-19, a Renaissance perspective. Thank you to you, the audience for tuning in. Uh, thanks for your questions. And just to tell Mona, there are lots of uh, very complimentary comments in the chat saying thanks for a great talk. So thank you again to our speaker, Mona Bosdog. This concludes our exchange talk for this week and look forward to having you join us next week. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.